Welcome uh, to our Gender Equality Week uh, session. We're very excited to have you here today. I know people are filing in. We had a large group of people registered and I'm just so pleased that people chose uh, to take the time uh, to explore this exciting question of a deep dive into feminist programming. My name is Julia Anderson and I am CanWatch's interim CEO. And really looking forward to the discussion uh, the discussion today. Also excited that we have an hour and a half. So we have time and I hope that the panelists will feel like they have time to explore the questions and really kind of get into it. So often we're working off these, you know, one minute to speak, 30 seconds to speak, and it's hard to uh, give, give time for these important, uh, important conversations. Uh, so I'm joining from Peterborough. One thing that I've loved about uh, COVID and all the Zoom opportunities is to hear the uh, traditional territories and the acknowledgement of where people are standing at that time because we're not all gathered together on the same land. We're sort of uh, sprinkled across. So Peterborough is the land of the Mississauga Anishinaabe people. Um, I've had the opportunity in my, my career and my time uh, in this place to work with elders, to learn a lot from elders. Um, and I hope that my words today give honor to those teachings that I've been so privileged to receive. We also opened uh, our gender equality programming uh, this week with, uh, um, with the Native, uh, Native Women's Association of Canada. Uh, and Chief Lorraine and just she offered some beautiful words and some beautiful kind of push a real push uh, to have us act in solidarity with Indigenous people this gender equality week and I promise to come back next year to talk about how far we had advanced with her uh, so please join me in in that journey in the coming year um, to, to think about how we can stand in solidarity with our Indigenous uh, with the Indigenous women and girls around us. So diving into the agenda, we have, as I said, an hour and a half. The inspiration for this conversation was, uh, if you're a policy wonk like me and spend a lot of time looking at words and things, you would have been excited about the FIAP, the Feminist International Assistance Policy and its launch. Um, you would have thought this is an exciting new moment for Canada to meet basic expectations of feminist principles and to imagine a world um, that is guided by those principles and certainly our international development work. Um, but you may have the question, what has happened? How far have we come? What has changed as the result of this important policy? What has changed as the result of our leadership as Canadians from a government, from a civil society perspective? So that was the inspiration uh, for why we put this panel together. And what we thought we would do is bring people to the table who not only uh, have demonstrated in their work a really clear understanding of the why, why it is we focus on gender equality, but who are actually kind of the, the uh, decision makers and brokers at the table who are doing the how. So they're in programming, they're doing work with feminist organizations, but also in grant making. Um, and we thought we could have a, an interesting and rich conversation uh, with those, like I said, those leaders who have a good sense of the why and a good sense of the how. So we want your questions. Um, we want uh, to engage with you, but we're also going to let our esteemed panelists engage with one another. So I would encourage you uh, to go off mute if you've heard something uh, on our panel that you want to respond to and that's that'll be my signal uh, because it's hard to watch if people are waving. So we have a bit of an order in which people will speak and different people responding to different questions but do feel free uh, to make this a conversation and to jump in and have hot pursuits uh, on ideas that come up because I think really that's uh, that's what people like to see and is what what's interesting and engaging and also will help us as panelists walk away with new information. So on the panel today, we have the Honorable Karina Gould, our Minister for International Development. Uh, she became the youngest female cabinet minister some time ago, uh, but also made history in that move. Uh, a true trailblazer and advocate for women's issues and gender equality, and certainly a, a good friend uh, to all of us who believe that international development is a key unlocking, has key unlocking potential for the world that we want to see. 
Jocelyn Mackey is the co-CEO at Grand Challenges Canada. She provides leadership and oversight to the organization and to this truly innovative platform uh, for grant making and supporting innovation. She's been recognized as one of Canada's top 40 under 40 uh, and a Canadian women leader in global health and also uh, is a member of the CanWatch Board of Directors and certainly we are very uh, grateful for that. Kate Higgins uh, is the interim CEO of Oxfam Canada. Before joining Oxfam, Kate worked for Civicus, a global alliance of civil society organizations and activists dedicated to strengthening citizen action and civil society around the world. Uh, Oxfam has been a, a trailblazer and a leader in all things uh, feminist programming and feminist principles. And we're so grateful to have you here today, Kate. And finally, uh, Remy Abba Faraj is a program officer for another super innovative Made in Canada um, fund called the Equality Fund. She supports the organization in grant making and partner accompaniment strategies with their global partners and is deeply connected with the feminist youth movements globally. And we're really excited to have in, in Jocelyn and in Remy uh, a representation of some of the ways that Canada is trying to do granting differently. Um, and then some of the ways with, with Kate and Minister Gould that Canada is, is doing our existing programming and uh, undertaking it with feminist principles. Before, before I dive in, I do want to acknowledge that yesterday there was a throne speech. Um, this is an opportunity for the Prime Minister and the Government of Canada to signal uh, to Canadians and uh, to their colleagues uh, across the floor what it is uh, is going to be important for the government. We were just beside ourselves with excitement to see the words we will invest more in international development while supporting, this is a quote, developing countries on their economic recoveries and resilience. Canada will also support work to ensure that people around the world have access to a vaccine. We cannot eliminate this pandemic in Canada unless we end it everywhere. So a huge uh, just congratulations. I think the theme of Gender Equality Week is because of her, so we're feeling that vibe for you, uh, Minister Gould. Uh, this is words, getting words into the throne speech, again, from the policy wonk uh, nerd uh, space over here, is like lifting a, you know, giant piece of lead and trying to get it up onto a, a big pedestal. That's a lot of words. Uh, that's a lot of words that you lifted, so uh, superhero status to you, and thank you so much, uh, for really pushing this with your colleagues and for having the meetings, for digging in and for getting this lens, um, which I know is deep in the values of, of our government, of the Canadian government, uh, but it's still sometimes hard to put in the front window and we certainly from a sector perspective, from a Ken Watch perspective, feel that this is in the front window and we're just really excited about what that means for our work and for Canada and, and uh, for our collective work together. So thank you to all of the panelists uh, for joining us today. I thought maybe we could just get started with a quick uh, rapid fire around how you define or what you think about when you think about feminist programming. Uh, we can do 30 to 60 seconds. I'll start with Minister Gould, then move to Jocelyn, then Remy, and then Kate. And I'd ask you just to note your order and just jump in once the person before you has gone on mute. So over to you, Minister Gould. Okay, thanks, Julia. So it really is the hot seat when I get to be the first one um, to go, but I should just start by um, thanking CanWatch as well for putting this event together. And I'm really excited to be on this panel with all of these incredible, amazing women who do such good work. Um, when I think about uh, feminist programming, um, I think of it from a intersectional feminist lens that really is trying to listen to what the needs are of people on the ground. It's trying to address and change power dynamics and of course focused on gender equality. Um, and you know, I think that you know, this, is, this is what's really exciting about where the FIAP has taken us as Canada. Um, you know, that uh, when I get uh, projects for approval, I get to ask you know, who was consulted 
um, what we're, what, you know, what are the needs on the ground? How are we responding? How is this changing power dynamics? How are we, um, you know, walking as allies for the most vulnerable, most mar marginalized and most vulnerable uh, and providing them the supports and the resources that they need to make the change uh, that's going to benefit them the most and really lift people out of poverty. And I think that, um, you know, what I'm, I was excited about when I was parliamentary secretary and we were doing the consultations and what I'm super excited about as Minister of International Development is knowing that, um, you know, Canada really is doing, you know, the heavy lifting, kind of the technical work to be those allies on the ground and to really address uh, systemic inequality. Um, you know, it's, it's long term work, it's, it's going to take a while, but we're, we're there, sleeves rolled up. Um, and really, you know, trying to do this in the most inclusive way possible to really achieve equality for all. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Minister Gold, for all of your leadership. I'm really thrilled to be here today uh, together with Remy and, and Kate and Julia. And thank you, CanWatch, uh, for your leadership in, in putting this together. For me, um, it's really about two clear things. It's about having greater impact more sustainably. We have countless examples in our portfolio of taking a gender lens or a feminist lens has enabled greater impact and more sustainable impact. So all the things that the minister said, I 100% agree with, and it's about having that greater impact more sustainably. And I think you can do that better and more effectively with a gender and feminist lens. Thank you, everyone. Good morning as well. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and be part of this amazing panel. Um, so really, to me, uh, feminist program is about undoing patriarchal relationships and really social structures. It's uh, the power over relationships and structures that harm everyone. And, and we all know that we have countless examples, as Jocelyn saying, um, especially women, young women, girls, trans and non-binary people. And feminist programming aims to raise the power and ambition of all women, young women, girls, trans and non-binary people who really carry many identities, uh, backgrounds and life experiences. So it, it's really about programming that supports and builds collective action and movement and really taking direction from organizations led by people they represent and acting truly on the concept of nothing about us without us. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm also thrilled to be here. Huge thanks to CanWatch for organizing this and a uh, huge congratulations to the minister on the throne speech. Um, why don't I take a bit of a different approach uh, in my rapid fire response? And I am going to talk about the who, what, and how of feminist programming. I think feminist programming has to put women's rights organizations and movements at its heart. And feminist programming is about making people, taking, taking an approach really thinks about people as being rights holders and agents of change, not beneficiaries. So that's, that's the who. The what, I think feminist programming has to be informed by a feminist analysis, which leads us to tackle difficult, stigmatized and challenging issues. And so that's difficult, but I think feminist programming really gives us the space to go into those issues that are so challenging. And then the how, feminist approach feminist approach to programming needs to be informed by feminist principles as Remy said nothing about us without us uh, thinking through the intersectional approach that we take to our programming I think that is that is really important and those principles have to inform our partnership development our design our implementation and our monitoring and evaluation so for me feminist programming is really going beyond band-aid solutions and it's really about unraveling the, those patriarchal norms and those economic and social structures which keep women poor. And uh, that's why I think the FIAP is, is, is really transformative and has so much potential. Excellent, thank you. I feel like we could have a, we could build our entire conversation actually on the comments that you've made. I'm gonna go into the questions, but encourage you again to, to jump in. Um, I think what I heard from all of you, our message is going deeper on asking the right questions, the right frameworks, the right lens in order to amplify and deepen impact. And I think that's a good sort of thread to pick up on as we go through, uh, go through these questions. So 
the, the next question is really how, from your perspective, um, has the FIAP um, shifted Canada's international assistance development process of the framework that Kate just gave, processes, programs, and practices, um, you know, to be more effective, integrated, responsive, uh, interested in, in, from your unique vantage points, uh, how you see that that's happened. So I'll start with you, Minister Gould, then move to Kate, then Jocelyn, then Remy. Well, I think one of the things I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing is how um, the remaining panelists have, have thought that this has changed and what work we still need to do. But I think from my vantage point um, as Minister of International Development, uh, you know, in the last year, Canada became the top donor uh, when it comes to gender programming. That, that's huge, right? I mean, that literally in three years, uh, you know, we, we went to the top. And so that's a big transformation. I think the other part of it is, is that we apply a rigorous GBA plus lens to all of our programming. We ask, you know, we have a, a very um, rigorous uh, gender analysis and evaluation that is applied to every single program. And when we get programs uh, and projects that come up to me for approval that um, you know, don't have uh, a gender equality lens, you know, we ask and I ask, okay, well, how, how could you change this, right? I mean, there's some that, you know, if it's the logistics of WFP, I mean, arguably that, that benefits, you know, um, everyone and, and is an important thing to do. But, you know, how is this working to change power dynamics? How is this working to respond to the local needs? What questions are we asking? Um, these are all really important. And I think, um, you know, the, the other thing, and the panelists previously in the previous question touched on this with regards to impact is, you know, we as a world have committed to the sustainable development goals, right? 2020 is supposed to be the decade for delivery. Of course, you know, we have this horrible pandemic that um, has impacted what we're doing, but at the same time, um, you know, we're not going to achieve the SDGs if we don't tackle gender equality. We're not going to achieve the SDGs if we don't deal with systemic inequality. So, you know, that's, that's what's, changing um, about the work that Canada is doing. And then I would say the other thing that's really exciting is um, at the international level, uh, because the FIAP is infused into our work and into our advocacy and into our diplomacy, it means that we have the opportunity and we are actually making strides in this to you know, make sure that gender is part of what our international and multilateral partners are doing as well. And because Canada has a seat at so many so many different tables um, in the multilateral system, we are really pushing and advocating um, for you know, a feminist approach, making sure gender equality is part of what we're doing. And um, I would say that for me, what's also really important is pushing institutions on anti-racism policies um, and their sustainability plans and their impact when it comes to climate change. And so you know, really taking a holistic feminist approach and Canada is able to make some really strong arguments and we're starting to see those changes uh, more broadly in the international system, which is quite exciting as well. Yeah, thanks. So when I think about how the FIAP has, has shifted Canada's approach to international assistance, uh, let me talk about three things, um, vision, priorities, and practice. So I don't think we should underestimate how transformative it is that this is a feminist international assistance policy. And the explicit focus on it being a feminist international assistance policy, I think has been a huge shift in, in the vision of international assistance in this country. I think as Minister Gould says, it's, it's critical for the approach that we take for our international assistance, but it's, we also see it permeating other uh, foreign policy spaces, which, which I think is, is really fantastic and, and really demonstrated, I think, this government's uh, preparedness to be, to be very bold. When I think about priorities and how priorities have shifted through the FIAP, let me again talk about the what, uh, the, the, the what and the who. Just to build on what I was saying earlier, I think the explicit naming of this being a feminist international assistance policy has given a number of us a lot of coverage and space to tackle those stigmatized, tough, difficult, controversial issues that we know need to be invested in to really shift the power dynamics in our economy 
and in our society. So when we think about Canada's leadership on sexual and reproductive health and rights, you know, the $1.4 billion annual investment in global health, $700 million annual investment in SRHR. This is bold feminist leadership. And I think really came through the framing that the FIAP gave us around international assistance. I think there are other spaces when we think about the issues that we're working on where we, where, where, where we could see more work. Uh, so for example, uh, the minister's mandate letter does have an explicit uh, priority around the paid and unpaid, uh, around paid and unpaid care. I think this is also, if COVID has shown us anything, it's that the care economy is absolutely critical for us in Canada, but also around the world. So I think this is another example where Canada, and we could all collectively show more leadership, there's a, there's a leadership vacuum here globally around the care economy. It's an explicitly feminist issue. We know how important it is for really tackling these inequities that are keeping women poor here in Canada and around the world. So I think it's another example of how the feminist international assistance policy is giving us space to move in and work on issues that have been stigmatized or frankly ignored. When I think about the WHO, just linking to what, what has already been said, the FIAP has really given us space to invest in women's organizations and movements. We know that is where the change is happening. We know that women's organizations and feminist movements are the catalysts for the sort of change that we want to see. And so I think the, the investment in, in women's rights organizations through the Women's Voice and Leadership Program, through the Equality Fund, it has given us all coverage to really prioritize this and be very, very deliberate and to hold each other to account for our investment in these really important organizations and movements. And then when I think about practice, this is where I think we have a little bit more shifting to do. So I think we have seen some good shifts, for example, in, in, in progress, uh, we've seen some progress on, on calls for proposals and requests for proposals timeframes and, and, and longer, bigger timeframes, which enables us to really work with feminist organizations, women's organizations on the ground to ensure they're really part of the co-design process around the programs that we want to seek support for from the Canadian government. But where there's more work for us to do, I think around compliance, we all know this is very challenging and is burdensome, and in some cases prevents us from working with the very organizations on the ground that we need to work on. I think on accountability frameworks, we have more work to do. I think we're all looking to, towards the accountability framework we will see on the Thrive Initiative, so we can really monitor and ensure that, that vision, and that commitment, and that investment is tracked and monitored, and we're holding each other to account on that. And of course, I don't need to go into this in that much detail, but when I think about practice, and I think about the localization agenda, and I think about giving organizations on the ground space to do the work they need to do, obviously Canada's charity legislation and framework around direction and control continues to, to, to provide challenges for us. So I would say great work on the vision, really good work on the priorities, some work to do on the practice. But I, think, I think we're all ready to work collectively on, on that part um, to really, really see this, this be up shift. Great, I think I'm next. Um, so I'm gonna riff off of uh, Kate's uh, who and how and what. Um, so in terms of the who, I mean, uh, when GCC started uh, 10 years ago, we, in the global health space, we were quite um, out ahead or different from our colleagues in the sense that we were supporting innovators and change makers based in low and middle income countries. And I know that uh, those of, of us in, in development, that doesn't seem transformative, uh, but I can assure you in the global health space, it certainly was. But what the feminist um, policy allowed us to do is to really double down on the nature of the organizations we, we support and to focusing on women-led um, entrepreneurs and innovators. 
And you know, across our international development um, portfolio, we now have 46% um, are women-led because of our concerted focus on that, and we're going to keep pushing at that. And it's different. You know, some of our portfolios are 60%, and other ones are kind of 30%. So we have work to do, um, but that certainly has has been um, a change on the on the who. On the how, you know, before the policy, I think like everyone, we had a gender equality policy and, and we, we did gender lens investing, but, you know, honestly, it was a little bit more of a check boxing exercise or box checking, sorry, exercise. And what the policy did for us is it really enabled us to go much more deeper um, asking the difficult questions, talking about intersectionality. Um, and so how we do our gender lens um, investing and our gender equality um, conversations with the innovators we support really went to a whole other level. And that's when we started to see changes in programming and changes in how the innovators we support uh, do their work. Um, and, and so that the, they how really started to shift um, in, in our work. And then finally, the what. You know, in, uh, before the policy, we had an emerging menstrual hygiene portfolio. We, we had innovations in the space here and there, but the concerted focus on sexual reproductive health and rights is really, um, had, had changed for us, started to change for us when the policy came in. I also think it's very safe to say that Grand Challenges Canada would not have launched our safe abortion challenge had it not been for the policy. It's called the Options Initiative. And without that policy cover, there's just no way that we as an organization would have launched that program. It was, an, uh, the first round uh, was announced by Minister Bibo when she was Minister of International Development. And so I, I can't say enough how a policy can really influence where dollars come from, because that program up to this point is not yet funded by the government of Canada. It will be. Um, but uh, just to show that we were able to crowd in dollars from other funders, but we needed the policy coverage to enable us to do that. Um, so it really had an impact um, not just on the who or the how, but also the what. Uh, so from our side, I mean, I think the Quality Fund is a great example um, of the FIAP as, as we were introduced. Um, it's not only shifted, but it took a risk with ambitious individual, which I think many describe as, as dreamers. Um, I mean, the Equality Fund is a groundbreaking collaboration that continues to harness diverse actors to catalyze new momentum for women's rights and feminist movements. Um, like we were building on the experience of the Match, Fund, Match International Women's Fund and with significant contributions from the Government of Canada and other donors. Um, this is all very new for all of us and, and with our amazing partners and, and thanks to the Canadian Government and the support of Minister Gold every step of the way, it has been truly vital. Um, so together we're really building something very, very new, um, which is a feminist institution in and out. Uh, the saying this uh, was really always top of mind for many of us is the responsiveness to providing resources to women's rights organizations and feminist movements really working on the grassroots level um, to the regional and global stage. Uh, we know they are leading the change in their communities and, and yes, the FIAP is groundbreaking um, and I think many of us here today are thankful it exists um, and, and as Kate really beautifully mentioned, I mean, we do we do believe we need more um it's not only about implementing rights-based feminist best practices that continue to make uh the FIAP a success and that is what the quality fund strategy is and and we remain committed to it um, and that is to support the priorities of women rights organizations and feminist movements that they actually identify on the ground that's great any uh quick hot pursuits not yet yes Kate. Uh, you asked, so I can. I, I just think something that, that I think it's really important to mention up front in this conversation is, is also the internal work that the FIAP has pushed many organizations to do. Um, you know, we, we know that gender just organizations, organizations that have internal processes and cultures and practices that are gender just, do better work supporting gender justice globally. And so I just think that that is important for us to reflect on. And I know that we're all doing work in different ways around 
How are we intersectional in our internal ways of working? What does that mean? Um, but I do think it's important for us to reflect on. I mean, as Oxfam's a big INGO, you know, Oxfam Canada, we've been doing our work for a long time to really be feminist. But there's still a lot of work that we need to do. Bureaucracy, I know, recognizes these. You'll have a lot of work to do. We're working with our partners on the ground to shift the way that, that to help them shift the way they work, to have the capacity to be more feminist in the way that they organize themselves. So I don't think we should lose that, that important internal dimension. And, and we, we focus a lot on the impact that we're having externally, but I, I think that impact is often a product of the internal culture and processes and practices of our organizations and our coalitions. I, yeah, I mean, so much of what has been said it, uh, resonates, but just picking up on that, you know, I think, um, from hiring practices to the way in which we operationalize our work plans and work with our teams. Um, I agree, and I come back to the word that multiple people said it, of coverage. Um, so it's like the excuse we shouldn't have needed, should not have needed to go forward in this way and with this work. Um, but as a, you know, as a, a feminist, but also a privileged um, white uh, woman, middle class woman, you know, having to, to to think about that in a good way and approach these things and think about our own indigenous communities in Canada. I mean, I think the FIAP has provided, as others have said, coverage for those conversations um, and kind of an, an imperative and a pushing of it. And that's incredibly powerful. And I can't wait. The ambition is that, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and Black and Indigenous, that these things come into those conversations within our organizations and our external versions of ourselves um, start to play out in that way. So this actually leads into the next question, which is around um, the feeling in the feminist movement and the gender equality movement that you're one step forward, three steps back. And certainly when we look at other donor countries, uh, we hear a lot about regressive policies uh, from major donors, our, our friends in the South, the Mexico City policy, these things. I mean, um, it's hard not to, to look glumly on the prospects of our work when you, when you think about that. But there have been countries, uh, Sweden, Canada, France, Luxembourg, and recently Mexico, that have adopted um, formally a feminist uh, foreign policy perspective. Um, so how has policy influenced partnerships on a global scale and in country programming is the question. I think, Minister, you actually started to talk about this, how Canada's adoption of a feminist approach has had global influence. Um, so picking up on that and just kind of uh, going from there, I would invite Minister Gould to speak, then Jocelyn, then Kate, and then Remy. Um, and yeah, thinking about how can how how are we as part of the GE five um, countries uh, having an influence uh, on the global stage? Yeah, it's a really really good and important question, Julia. And I mean, I think there's obviously some uh, a lot of concern with um, you know the president's decision to kind of double down on the Mexico policy. Um, Mexico City policy, um, you know, the latest review um, of 2020 has demonstrated that, you know, we're seeing an increase um, in unsafe abortions, and that is having a, you know, a serious impact on um, women's rights and women's health. Um, and I think we, you know, we all share this, but we, we know it because it's based on fact is that, you know, limiting women's access to abortion does not mean there are fewer abortions. Right, it means there are more unsafe abortions, and that we're actually putting their health and safety at risk. And um, you know, I think Canada and, and me personally are very committed to being very strong and vocal advocates um, in the global community on this. Um, you know, even just this morning, there was um, a meeting um, as as part of UNGA um, with the top ten humanitarian donors that was hosted by the United States, and I made a very explicit point to say that if we are going to you know, respond to the needs of women in humanitarian settings, um, you know, it, it, SRHR has to be part of that, right? Um, you know, it, it, is, it is fundamental to making sure that they have what they need in those crisis situations. 
in addition to overall and in, in general. And so we're going to continue to be very strong and very vocal and working with um, you know, partners who, who share, that, um, share that view. And you know, as a She Decides champion and as part of that movement, you know, we are doing um, what we can at the global level to make sure that, that, this, that this issue you know, doesn't lose space um, and that we keep moving forward on it. And um, you know, thank you for the comments that you've made about you know, the, the bold commitment that Canada has made to SRHR, to the Thrive Agenda, to the funding that we've committed to keep advancing this, but we're going to keep trying to crowd others in. Uh, to this space because obviously, you know, Canada's funding alone is, is not going to solve the issue. But I think um, where, where we have a lot of opportunities, so I, I was talking with one of our officials who made the point to me that, um, you know, multilateral institutions know that they can't get a new project past the board with a Canadian on it if gender equality is not you know, is, is not sufficient, right? Like they can't just check a box. They actually have to prove their homework. So that's, that's an important achievement that we've made, right? Because we've been dogged in saying that this is, you know, we are not going to accept something that doesn't fully integrate gender equality and you have to show your work, right? And what the impact is going to be on the ground. That's really important. I think the other thing is that um, you know, with other partners, so Sweden, France, the Netherlands, Mexico, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, we've also created a space for um, feminist activists in the global south who maybe, um, you know, live in countries where they don't have the same kind of, um, you know, ability to speak freely on these issues uh, to work in partnership with us, right? And we provide the support to and the space to civil society um, to have those conversations and, and really kind of open some of those doors for those global conversations. And we're going to continue to be really strong in that. And, you know, having Remy here from uh, the Equality Fund is super important because that's some of the work that the Equality Fund and the Women's Voice and Leadership Program that, you know, Kate mentioned is, is really, you know, committed to doing. But I think it's also important, you know, sometimes um, I feel like countries might be like, oh, there's Canada on gender equality again. But we have to keep pushing for it because <laughs> there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and this is a long term process. But I think it's also about, you know, understanding like what what are what are our objectives, right? Our, our objectives are, you know, um, lifting people out of poverty and putting people into a space where they can enjoy their their full spectrum of rights. And that's something that, you know, I think a lot of countries can get on board with um, and helping, you know, to kind of, you know, explain and describe why um, women's equality and gender equality is important to that is something that I think we do well and that we're going to keep pushing on. But it, it's certainly a challenge because, you know, there are uh, forces at play that want to roll those rights back. And I, I always think that like 2020, this was the year of generation equality. This was the year of Beijing plus 25. And, you know, unfortunately we couldn't all gather together to, to you know, really keep pushing these things forward, but we can't let go of them, right? And, um, you know, so it's really important that we keep on it, we keep focused um, and, you know, in, you know, I'm doing this in an in international context whenever I can um, is to keep, you know, bringing attention to these issues, um, you know, because it, it, well, it, it's just so vital and, and so important. But I think that it also, my final point, and is just to say that it, it creates space for others to join us um, and it creates space for those who, who feel uncomfortable with, um, you know, some of, some of the counter work that's going on to, you know, gravitate somewhere else, right? Um, maybe not explicitly, but at least in a in a more comfortable space. And so that's something that we'll continue to work on. Am I next, Julia? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so building off of uh, Minister, what what you said, I think uh, it's really we've on the partnership level really thought about the creating space. How do we create space so that the partners that we um, uh, work with can come into this realm together with us? You know, every year uh, we're part of this network called the Grand Challenges Network, which is a network of funders uh, in the ecosystem. 
And every year there's an annual Grand Challenges meeting. This year it was supposed to be in, in India. Uh, we'll be doing it virtually in October. Um, and, for, and, and this year it's done in conjunction with Women Lift Health. And it's been really um, fascinating to see the evolution of our largest partners, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and to see the conversations that they're having about gender equality and putting it in the front window, right? This is a, a convening of thousands of scientists who come together and policymakers and, and funders and decision makers. And so I do think that there are real changes happening in the conversation um, that I'd like to say the unusual suspects um, sometimes are coming in also. And to me, that's also transformative um, because I think it's important that we, we want to still, we, like we have partners on, on the line who are focusing on the, the um, women's rights movement and we need that and we need to push that. But I think we also need to be having these conversations with those who are perhaps less comfortable in this space or don't come from that world. And that's also important and can be transformative. Uh, a second example I'll give, um, we're part of a partnership for a humanitarian grand challenge. Uh, the minister talked about uh, humanitarianism. And that challenge is funded by the US government, so USAID, um, the UK government, and uh, the Dutch, and then Canada's there. And um, the, the, they are all interested in gender equality. I mean, they talk about it differently, for sure, uh, all of them, all of the, the partners and funders, um, but they recognize the importance of that and we have played a role of pushing that in a way and they're open to it. So there is a way to work with partners, at least in my experience, where the, the terminology and the um, isn't comfortable, um, not where they go to first, but when you take it down and talk about what we're really talking about, the power imbalances and the impact we're looking to have and the decision making, they say, oh yeah, that's just good development policy. And, and so, you know, that's what we found uh, working with, with um, partners and, and sort of moving slowly. Some you can really move quickly with other ones, it's sort of one step at a time. So just two examples um, in our kind of um, ecosystem of partnership where we've seen some, some traction, much more work to be done. Uh, and I think I'll stop there. I think it's me. Uh, yeah, thanks. This is such a great way to spend the morning. Um, so when I think about how this feminist approach has, has influenced policy partnerships and has influenced in-country programming, I mean, I think at the global and multilateral level, I think the language around crowding in is really useful. Um, you know, how do we kind of, how do we take how, how, do we, how do we engage with unusual suspects? How do we kind of broaden the tent around these issues and, 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 and kind of move forward on gender equality and, and on this feminist future that we all believe in? So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of value in that, in that and, and we shouldn't ignore that. But I also think we cannot ignore what the investment in the global women's movement means. And uh, we have, in many cases, these feminist foreign policies here in Canada and around the world, because feminist organizations, women's, women's rights organizations organized and demanded them. And so really continuing this investment in the global women's movement, I think is absolutely critical. And is and, and we've seen we've seen the benefits of doing that through the Equality Fund, through the W7, through other initiatives where we've managed to bring global feminists together. And I think we we should really value. Um, investing in local women's organizations on the ground, but also provide opportunities for them to connect in countries, across regions, across the world, as, as a global feminist movement. The final issue I would like to just talk about um, is, I don't think we should underestimate the challenge of having a feminist foreign policy. We have a feminist international assistance policy and there's so much for us to celebrate. But to truly have a feminist foreign policy is very challenging. And there are, there are contradictions that we're faced with as we look at, at our foreign policy in practice. So whether that's the arms trade versus our peace ambitions around the world, whether that's trade policy versus our ambitions around workers' rights and human rights around the world. 
So I think taking a step back and, and the Canadian government's commitment to a feminist foreign policy, Minister Gould's commitment, Minister Champagne's commitment to, to a feminist foreign policy is really exciting. I just think we should acknowledge that there's a lot of work for us to do to really move this forward. I think there is a huge amount of excitement here in Canada around a feminist foreign policy, an acknowledgement of the challenges of really making it, it real, but I think a real willingness for us to work as allies, as civil society organizations, with the government in really moving this forward because we understand the impact that this can have. We understand how much work there is for us to, to make it happen. But um, I think we shouldn't underestimate the challenges that the huge impact we can have if we can really see that coherence across a range of different foreign policy uh, areas and spaces. I, um, I think we, we all agree, I mean, policy influences partnerships on a global scale considerably. And, and I mean, it's clear that clear, clear parts involve building trust, listening, adapting, and really providing flexible funding for women's rights organizations and feminist movements. Um, I mean, policy is only good as its implementation, of course, and, and feminist high-level policies are really critical and require rigor and commitment. Uh, for them to really trickle down to the ground and have that ripple effect. Um, so for us, I mean, our, our current partners, for example, that we're working with, I mean, we already know they're already working in extremely challenging contexts um, now, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we listen to our partners and understand that working at 100% capacity, which was already difficult, is next to impossible, um, you know, as our staff are living out the impact of multiple crises in their own lives, families, and communities. Um, so we actually ensure that budgets support the holistic security of activists and movements, including digital security uh, through our COVID-19 response fund over the summer, which allowed us to be agile and respond when partners requests came through. Um, but for us right now, what we're really most worried about, um, and I believe it's important to highlight today, is really women rights organizations, especially human rights defenders that continue to fall through the cracks. Uh, for instance, we have partners working with Yazidi genocide survivors in northern Iraq who are headquartered in Germany. Um, another organization we support working on uh, sexual gender-based violence in Egypt, based in the U.S., both doing vital work, um, extremely risky work, however, forced to pivot their strategy and, and, and really be based in non-official development assistant countries due to security and legal risks. So, um, and I think like with everyone, we're committed similar to other organizations to continue to make the case for these type of organizations, um, especially human rights defenders that are falling through the cracks as we move for forward in our grant making. Um, and of course, we're wanting to continue to support Minister Gold and the Canadian government to really push the feminist policy forward as Case and Jocelyn and, and Minister Gold have rightly mentioned today. So I really wanted to push it forward because it is challenging on multitudes of level. Um, and me being someone that really is connected on the ground, given my day to day work, it's a way to really see how we can kind of bridge the gap and see how we can collectively uh, reach that change together. That's great. And the next couple of questions um, are more uh, pro programmatic. So um, I'm going to turn to the programming organizations. But um, maybe just a question to hold in your head based on hot pursuit from this conversation um, that I'll ask at the end. Maybe I'll take the moderator's prerogative and ask my own question. One story, so, so I heard from all of you, whether it's in, you know, multilateral spaces in your meetings this morning, Minister Gould, or, you know, all three of you mentioned, all four of you mentioned convincing people and the language shifts and the kind of the way in which we influence and persuade um, others to come along. So whether that's organizations that we're working with, whether it's through other institutions. And I'm wondering if you have one personal example of a time that you adopted your language, but stay true to your principles and actually brought someone on, on board, brought someone over. Um, because this is like a, th this to me is the biggest challenge. We've used words in this presentation like intersectional and they are hard fought for words and wins that we have those words to understand and analyze. Um, but they're not accessible and this, the language of gender equality is not accessible to all. And, you know, Minister Gould talking about being like the flight attendant saying the same message everywhere that everyone knows Canada's coming and so exits are here and gender equality here, you know, 
that notion of repeating the same thing, sometimes we find new ways of saying that. So just interested in your stories, uh, but I'll bring that to the end. Um, if you have any personal stories about having convinced someone and, and how you did that or brought someone along. Um, so in the service delivery questions, really interested, we talked a lot kind of at the policy level, um, but what about other programs and, and spaces such as, you've talked a little bit about advocacy uh, movements, but maybe diving deeper um, beyond just the kind of technical programming that we do. Um, how have these other spaces benefited from feminist policies? Um, and then I'll just tack on to that, how do you engage unusual suspects such as boys and men? You, all of you have mentioned that and a little bit more on, on the how. So we've got two questions in one, um, the additional spaces that we go and the additional people uh, that we engage along, along this journey. So I'll start with, uh, maybe we'll start with Kate uh, and then Remy and then Jocelyn. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I always like talking about our programming because that's where so much of the important work happens, even though, if I'm honest, I'm a bit of a policy wonk. Um, I think, uh, I, I want to talk about two things. One is the importance of advocacy in our programming. And the second is an, an engaging, engaging boys and men. So in at, at Oxfam, we are, we are an organization that believes deeply in the, in the power of influencing. And we, are, we do this work because we don't want just band-aid solutions. We want real transformative change. And so for a long time, our theory of change um, as an organization has really had influencing or advocacy as a key component. So that means through our programming, supporting organizations on the ground, through the advocacy work that they need to do to really see systems, policies, structures change in their societies. So there's some really interesting, fantastic examples. Um, for example, we have a great program called Creating Spaces, which is around ending violence against women and girls in South and Southeast Asia. And key to that is supporting advocacy organizations. And so last year, um, Coalisi 18 Plus, which is a coalition that uh, worked for ending child early and forced marriage, had this really fantastic win, which is that the marriage law in Indonesia changed and the marriage law changed from 16 to 19 years of age. I think that's a really important example of how through our programming, we fund and support in sustainable ways, advocacy organizations. And then we really see legislative change that is going to have a very real impact on the lives of women and girls in Indonesia. In the Philippines, uh, at the end of this month, actually, the Philippine Safe Abortion Advocacy Network, which is a partner of, of Oxfam, um, is, is publicly launching a bill to decriminalize abortion on, on International Safe Abortion Day. I think, you know, being able to fund in a sustainable way organizations and coalitions through programming that Global Affairs Canada supports really demonstrates how advocacy is also really important. So service delivery is key, but the importance and the power of investing in advocacy, I think is, is very real. Um, on engaging unusual suspects and boys, there's some really interesting work uh, that we're doing in, in South and Southeast Asia, again, around sexual and reproductive health and rights, but also around uh, ending uh, child early and forced marriage. And this is really by seeking to change social norms, by working with religious leaders, by working with community leaders, by working with young boys clubs, and really having those conversations to try and shift the dialogue and shift the conversation around social norms change. This, I think, um, I think someone mentioned earlier that this work is often two steps forward, one step back, or sometimes one step forward, two steps back. And in preparing for, for this conversation today, I was reading the really detailed and very interesting um, reports and reviews we have from these programs and some really honest reflections around the challenges of engaging in social norm change work in, in patriarchal and religiously conservative contexts. That I, I, think, I think we have seen in some of these contexts the power of working with imams, of working with religious leaders to really 
to really change the channel on these conversations. I think Minister Gould said earlier, this is, this is, you have to be in this for the long game. You have to play the long game. And, and I think to see uh, the Canadian government uh, investing in this sort of work where you do not see a direct impact straight away that is absolutely measurable by the number of things you've distributed, but where you can really track over several years how norms in a community have changed to the benefit of women and girls around ending violence against women, around access to sexual and reproductive health and rights is so, so important. And I think the FIAC and the Feminist International Assistance Policy is giving us space to invest in these places where we do really see long term sustainable generational change on these issues. Um, so I, have, I mean, I have the privilege to work and be in conversation with partners directly on the ground nearly every day. Um, so this could be like a several day conversation. Uh, but I mean, the contribution to gender equality with a strength based approach, I, I mean, meaning it's given not only in specific to funding deficits, but also investing in resilience um, is enormous. And it's something continuously expressed um, by you know, by our partners within our different programs at the Quality Fund um, and beyond. Um, so for me, I think it's important, I'd, I'd love to highlight a few of our partners that are really contributing um, and really working within this feminist policy on a local level. Um, so we have our, our partner in Nepal, I mean, and there's a varying group, we have more than 30 partners right now. Um, They're applying an intersectional approach that recognizes uh, the responsibility of working with diversity of people in their communities. Uh, so it's really challenging the siloing of issues related to gender, disabilities, and indigeneity in a context where it's already difficult for Indigenous women to access funding from mainstream funders, but an additional challenge of living with a disability and being able to actually secure support uh, and working within organizations within Nepal. Um, we have our partner in Afghanistan, for example, that implements innovative ideas especially within their context where they actually run women run restaurants um, that are harassment free in the middle of Kabul that employs women from their safe shelters in order to provide them with economic opportunities. Um, they, they continue to be survivors of their harsh reality while also engaging in ways to actually support their households. Um, and their innovative approach has continuously proven to have a track record um, and their strategies are working as well. Um, in Lebanon, we do have partners that work with kind of the unusual suspects that kind of fall through the cracks as well, which they really focus on valuing and paying attention to the lived experiences of these diverse communities, um, especially the ones falling right on the sideline due to varying realities and the multitudes of challenges currently facing Lebanon. And our partners strive to work with not only women and young women, but they're specifically focusing on supporting Syrian and Palestinian refugees and migrant workers that we often don't hear about. Um, and they're always trying to find ways to really um, amplify their voices in terms of advocacy as well and creating those spaces, uh, as Jocelyn and Kate mentioned, on, you know, on local, regional and, and global stages, being through trainings, workshops, uh, and as well as spaces that are now virtual, of course. Um, and, and in terms of engaging with men and boys, I mean, we, we often see women rights organizations and feminist movements i mean solely focusing on working with women especially young women and girls at least from our experience at the, at the start um, however once they become more established we see them shifting and starting to engage with men especially young men and boys um, and this is particularly the case uh, when they're trying to seek sh social change and norms and behaviors as, as kate highlighted um, so for example, our partner in Nepal in the past three years has been working specifically with adolescent girls through their flagship program called Her Turn. Um, and then after hearing a lot from the girls themselves in the various trainings that they were doing with them, um, there were numerous requests from the girls that they actually argue that boys need to be informed about all the information that the girls are getting as well. Um, so they actually created a second flagship program called His Chance. Um, and it was a way to actually engage with boys directly and, vo and involve them in social change for gender equality. Um, so it's actually delivered by young local men that, were, that are trained by our partner. 
Um, and their workshops educate the boys on many, many health issues from puberty to hygiene, even menstruation, um, and even safety issues um, with bullying, harassment, purely marriage, human trafficking. And I mean, the, the workshop uses gender transformative approach. And I think Julia, to your question earlier for later, I think that's important to see how we use this language and localize it as well. But I really encourage, and they've shown that it's actually created depth in discussions on power dynamics within their communities. So exposing men and boys on how they affect girls, young men, young women and women, and even boys and men themselves amongst each other is how they can better understand why and how they can become allies to, in order to actually create that social impactful positive change through the process. Great, uh, so I think I can best answer uh, these two questions with examples. Um, two innovations, uh, both with funding from Global Affairs Canada, really illustrate uh, for me um, uh, kind of the, the beyond service delivery point. The first one is an innovation in Kenya, um, focused on Korea uh, County. And it's, a, it's an innovation about educating um, uh, girls and families um, to end female genital mutilation. Um, and it's early stages. It's one of our uh, one of the seed projects that we're watching very carefully. Um, but uh, you know, the innovation uses a, a so solar power device. It's delivered by Child's Life International um, about educating and advocating. And so far, some really exciting results. You know, over ninety percent of the parents uh, that have been part of this um, have signed declarations against F FGM um, and and change makers. So I think it's that. Um, combination of uh, inter, you know, uh, new approaches uh, with advocacy can really be the powerful uh, combination, and often both are required. So that's that's one example in our portfolio that we're proud of and and watching closely to see if the evidence continues to to support this approach. In terms of engaging. Um, uh, boys and, and men, lots of examples uh, of how critical this is. You know, I've been thinking about a uh, passage in, in this book that I read recently, uh, White Fragility, about how, you know, uh, really required men to grant women suffrage in, in the U.S. They were talking about this and how you have to engage the power, those with the power, with the decision making if we want to affect change. Um, and so I, you know, a, a, another example is a, an innovation called Mom Connect. Um, they're out of South Africa by an organization called Pray Kelt, and it's an M Health uh, mobile health uh, innovation, providing new moms uh, with health information. And when we engaged in a gender equality assessment with them, you know, this is a, a women-led organization. They're embedded in the government system, so it's very sustainable, a really great innovation. We kind of thought, oh, they'll fly through this. They looked at their programming and they said, mom connect. Wow, no wonder we're not having any dads coming. We really are trying to engage dads. So, you know, they, they looked at their processes and said, we need to re rethink our marketing. Um, and they also looked at some of their own practices um, themselves. Again, a women-led organization. It wasn't actually, they weren't thinking about intersectionality, um, about diversity, about um, uh, gender diverse individuals. And so it was fascinating watching this awesome organization who's doing really great work go through this and realize how it was really reinforcing uh, stereotypical gender norms, even in their name. Um, and so, you know, an example of how this approach uh, can actually be counter, you know, really important to engage uh, uh, boys and men because uh, they're essential. I really appreciate that everyone used examples and it's generating uh, a lot of questions, which is great, I think, to concretize um, some of the concepts, examples and stories of programming uh, and conversations can be, uh, can be really helpful uh, for people to kind of uh, zoom in on. So the last question uh, before we open it up to the Q&A is, um, if we're to stand proud of what we have with the FIAP, of much of what you described, recognizing how far we have to go and that the ambition of a feminist international assistance policy is really, it, it's 
it's an ambition like no other if we're really going to apply it. Um, but standing proud based on what, we, what we've done so far, um, what can the world learn from uh, Canada as a feminist funder? Um, maybe I'll turn first uh, to Minister Gould, uh, and then Remy, uh, and then Jocelyn, and then Kate. Um, thanks, Julia. I might uh, just kind of follow up on some of the other panelists because I was thinking about it and, you know, I think in terms of, you know, changing language and, and being accessible, I think it's also about what we and how we define feminism, right? And I think part of it is, is that sometimes, and I'm a self-declared feminist since basically the moment I could start talking, but um, that sometimes people think of feminism and, you know, and, and this is, you know, other people, and they think, oh, this is about um, changing power dynamics and inverting them, right? It's about women being over men, or it's about those things. And I think what's really important is to, um, you know, to also to, to really be clear with people about it's about equality, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about, um, you know, like, it's not, I'm, I'm trying to find the right words here, but it, it's not about like, you know, saying like, okay, you're not important anymore. It's about saying we actually believe everybody is important and we believe that everybody has these rights and everybody should have the same opportunities. And I just was reflecting on um, a visit that I took to Kenya when I was the parliamentary secretary and I visited a school. And I thought it was a girls' school because there were only girls there. And I was talking to them about, you know, staying in education and all this stuff and, you know, all their future. And then this teacher came up to me and he said, would it be okay if you address the boys as well? And I was like, the, what? The boy, like, where, where are the boys? And they said, oh, well, you know, we know Canada's feminist, and so you're only interested in girls. So we asked the boys to stay inside while you talk to the girls. And, you know, for me, that was like, oh, no, no, that is like the absolute um, opposite of, you know, what we, are, what we are trying to achieve. And actually, we need everyone here together to be having this conversation together. And, um, you know, I think, you know, particularly that, that, that is a moment that really broke my heart in that we need to do a better job of, of communicating um, to partners and um, that, you know, that this is, when we talk about, you know, gender equality, we, we are literally talking about equality, right, between the genders. Um, and you can't leave, you know, boys and men out of, out of that conversation. And so that for me is a really poignant example of, of why it's important to, to keep having this conversation and um, you know, to think very carefully about, about the language that we use. Um, and you know, I, will, I will acknowledge that I think I still have work to do on that as well, um, but it's something that you know, is a continuous learning process. And I think um, just to get to your question in terms of you know, what the world can learn from Canada is that there's, there is actually a benefit to everyone when we pursue equality, right? Um, and that that is something that, you know, uh, we still have a lot of work to do here in Canada. We still have a lot of work to do uh, in our international programming and the partnerships and the, um, the relationships that we're working on and that we're building on. But the, the ultimate, I think, you know, thing that I would like for others to take away is that, you know, we're all better off um, when we pursue equality, right? And that, you know, when we um, actually focus on women's rights and uh, enabling them to have access to a holistic version of their rights, that everyone in society is better off. And so this is something that actually there is a, um, you know, if I can be a, a bit more pragmatic, like there is a self-interest for everyone um, to pursue gender equality and the rights of women, the rights of uh, LGBTQI individuals um, and the rights of marginalized groups because we are all better off um, when people can enjoy their, their, their full suite of rights. Is me, right, Julia? Great. Um, that was an interesting point, Mr. Gold. I actually just came back after working abroad for 10 years, and I'm actually trying to learn the words to use based in Canada now. So I guess sometimes like, oh, you're not using feminist terminology. And I'm like, but these are the words <laughs> that you work with in communities and grassroots levels. So it's really interesting the nuances in terminology depending on, on the audiences that, that you're engaging with. Um, but to answer the question, I mean, um, for me, I think a big lessons learned 
which is linked to waste forward and, and so forth, is, is really about innovation. Um, for me, innovation is key and, and really being open to new ways of working while at the same time doing things that are tried and true. Uh, so I believe that's really something that we can learn from Canada. Um, and it's what innovation can look like, um, going beyond the usual suspects and understanding that innovation is context specific. So it's really about recognizing the importance of risk and supporting learning by experimentation, uh, flexibility and processes to support local innovations led by women's rights groups, accessibility of application, for example, um, support groups at their early stage of development, um, you know, groups that are trying to establish themselves as well, aiming to test new ideas, strategies and approaches, uh, supporting different strategies and ways of working, being art, sports, I mean, even comedy we see coming forward more in satire, um, peer learning and now technology with our new normal of working with COVID. Uh, it's really about investing and encouraging unique or unlikely collaborations between women's groups across movements as well, and potentially unlock new strategies and, and really about groups both visible and underground and increasing momentum in unique political moments and, and advocacy opportunities but really truly amplifying their voices on a global stage. So I would say, I mean, Canada's a feminist vendor, we're, we're, we're on our way um, in terms of innovation, uh, but there are key points that remain challenging to commit to, um, but we're getting there, um, especially in terms of the support and push from partners and allies. I think we, we need to continue to pay attention to what we invest in and buy and really catalyze change for really achieving uh, greater gender equality. Uh, Kate, am I next? No. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot the because I changed it. So you go. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so, Julia, to answer your uh, question you had before, certainly I'll be very honest that I use different language with different audiences. Um, when we're talking with a angel investor who are trying to crowd into one of the social innovations, we talk about how it's good business um, and and why and the you know the revenues that they'll have when they think about half the population and how to actually serve the women customers, right? So I, I, we certainly do use different language depending on, on the audience, still staying true to, to why we're doing it, um, but it, it's, it's how I've uh, found um, that we can be more impactful. To answer the question of, you know, what, what can Canada learn? I'm going to say, what can Canada learn from Canada um, in the sense that, you know, the sustainable development goals are not just for international, they're for here at home too. Um, and I'm really proud of the Indigenous Innovation Initiative um, that's hosted at Grand Challenges Canada. Indigenous leaders, this is our non-ODA ODA work, Indigenous um, leaders came and asked us to use our innovation platform to support Indigenous entrepreneurs and innovators. And thanks to funding from the Department of Women and Gender Equality, we, had, we launched our first program uh, for Indigenous women and uh, two-spirit, queer, and gender diverse um, entrepreneurs and innovators. And we had applications from every province and every territory and uh, very excited we'll be able to announce those in the next couple of months. But I think the point that I'm trying to make um, with that example is that the feminist international assistance policy can be, you know, transformative internationally, but it can also be right here at home too. Um, and I think we have an obligation as Canadians um, to, to take those approaches um, here also. And uh, so little twist to your question, uh, Julie, I hope you don't mind. Uh, thanks. Let me answer your question first, uh, Julia, around um, having conversations. At, at Oxfam Canada, we have been focused on women's rights and gender equality for over a decade, for a long time, before the fee app, before, you know, this, this, this bold Canadian ambition and investment. Uh, we were really an agency that, that focused solely on women's rights and gender justice, but it was a change. And so I've had very interesting conversations with Canadians who support us who believe in our work, who have supported our work for a couple of decades and, and having conversations on, are around the journey that, that they have come on with us uh, from going from an organization that was maybe really 
considered or, or recognized as a solely humanitarian organization, so an organization that did more programming and advocacy work, worked on gender equality and women's rights, and now is very proudly feminist. It's very, been very interesting to have those conversations. And, and still, the, the, the language we use, we have, to, we have to be careful around language use to, to take our supporters on a journey. But what I have actually found most illuminating is talking to people and hearing them play back the journey that they have gone on with us. And so I think that gives me a lot of confidence that um, we can go on this journey together. We have to be, we have to play the long game. Um, but I do think people get to the point where they see this is about equality for everyone, and it's better for us all to be taking a feminist approach. To answer the question around what I think the world can can learn from Canada as a, as a feminist funder, I, I think I have three points. One is that being bold does not break you. I think uh, the government was bold to announce a feminist international assistance policy, and it, it meant that a lot of us had to kind of, there was a lot of catching up to do across the sector for innovators, for consultants that work in this space, for civil society. So I think, I think it's just really important to recognize that being bold does not pose a risk is insurmountable and it actually pushes us all further. So I think that has been fantastic. I think the second issue, um, and I may be sounding like a broken record, but I, I do sincerely hope that the legacy of the FIAP is Canadian leadership and investment in, in neglected issues that other governments, other donors, for whatever reason, do not have the space or cover to invest in. So whether that is around the women's movement, whether it's around SRH subs, whether it's around the care economy and how important it is for someone to step up in the care economy through international assistance. I do hope that, that, that other donors, other funders look to Canada and see that investing in this, these spaces makes sense and can really have an impact. I think the importance of investing in women's rights organizations is something that Remy has, has, has talked about in a much more articulate way than me. But I just want to say one thing about this, which is that at Oxfam Canada, our, our work uh, with women's rights organizations and feminist actors is not just through our work through the, the Women's Voice and Leadership Program, whether it's women's economic justice, SRH, ending violence against women. Women's rights organizations and feminist movements are central to our theory of change in those spaces. So, I think really embedding and integrating the importance of women's rights organizations and feminist movements in all of our international assistance work is really important. And then the final, and I hesitate to, to finish on a, on, a, on, a, on a more negative note, but I think if I was to say to, to other funders around the world, what can you learn from Canada as a feminist funder? I think it's don't underestimate the challenge or the work that has to be done to connect the feminist vision and ambition with a feminist practice and implementation. And this is not me being overly critical of the government or, or myself as someone who works for a big bureaucratic INGO. I think we all need to look ourselves in the mirror and realize that it's hard work, it's work that is worth doing, but we shouldn't underestimate the challenge really implementing and, and making these feminist ambitions a reality. I think that's uh, that's great, and I I don't even see that as a negative way to end because it's um, you know honesty is a good path, and I think being aware of the challenge and also the time that it takes to be to to do the work, uh, aware of the long game. It's been mentioned by again all the speakers that this is not um, if there was a silver bullet here, the smart people on this call would have found it. If there was an easy path we would already be there. There's there's no end to the commitment, but the work is hard, the work is difficult. We have um, a couple minutes for one uh, closing question from the floor. Um, and uh, for all the questions that have come up, some have been answered. We've been trying to to look at the ones that have been answered and, and um, the ones that haven't. But what I'm going to commit to is to following up uh, with the panelists um, and getting some uh, where there's specific uh, questions to specific people. I will follow up and I will send that out with the recording of this uh, webinar to you, some responses to keep this conversation going. Um, I also encourage you to to ask, there's a lot of good and positive and constructive questions and uh, feel free to put those out on Tag Can Watch uh, on Twitter. 
um, or elsewhere and we can again keep the conversation going because I think you've heard that that is critical. So I'll ask you each of the speakers this this last question because it is the the COVID informed and ever present in our community question. I think it's a great one to wrap up on. Uh, and then I'll, I'll ask you to give your closing remarks uh, as you go through the speaker list. And I'll start with you, Minister. So uh, how can the development community, our community, cede greater ownership of feminist pr principles, foundational feminist principles uh, within other foreign policy uh, communities? And how can we, um, sort of promote and push a localization agenda at the same time. So we're talking about other foreign policy communities that uh, Kate mentioned, diplomacy, trade, defense, um, and how can we bring all of this uh, to the localization agenda. So 45 to 60 seconds with your final thoughts wrapped up as well in there. Oh, okay. Um, it's, it's a really good question. I think um, part of it is that um, I think the sector needs to continue to expand engagement with those other areas of Canada's foreign work um, and to really have those conversations, but also to, to, I think it talks, it's a bit to your question, Julia, of how do you, how do you change your language depending on who you talk to? And I think the other part of it is that it's something I struggle with because I, um, you know, want to be as blunt and direct as possible and to say like, this is what you need to do, otherwise nothing else matters. Um, but at the same time, you know, you have to bring people on the journey with you. And, you know, I think that particularly, you know, when you talk, one of the things that I find really interesting is the people who get development the best out of the whole foreign policy, international work architecture are actually the defense people. Right. And part of the reason is, is because they're there, they're on the ground, they see what the issues are. If you talk to any of our Canadian Armed Forces members who have been on deployment, um, you know, who've been in Afghanistan, who've been in the Middle East, who've been uh, on peacekeeping missions, they get development so fundamentally. And they can actually be some of our biggest allies because they recognize that unless you have, you know, there's the continuum between um, development and peace and security, right? And in, if you don't have uh, security, you're not going to have peace and then you're not going to have development, but it goes the other way too, right? Uh, if you don't have development, you're not going to have security and you're not going to have peace. And so I think being able to expand that conversation is really important to not always see them as adversaries and to recognize that we actually share a lot in common. Um, and we have we have similar objectives and recognizing that we we all need to be working together, I think is 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 really important in, in that space. And so I would encourage um, those, you know, who who are on this call and who are extraordinarily passionate about development to reach out and have those conversations. And um, if I could just, um, I guess my final wrap up point is, um, you know, I think in terms of bringing people along the journey, um, it's important to focus on our shared objectives and our shared humanity. And I think that, um, you know, it, it, we want to use the language, you know, I, I want to tell everyone I'm a feminist. I want to tell everyone uh, that, you know, it, like SRHR is, is non-negotiable um, if we are to truly achieve the objectives um, that, that, that we share. But you also have to um, meet people where they're at. Um, and you have to be able to find common ground and a shared objective, and then to be able to say, well, in order for us to meet that shared objective, here are the things we need to do to get there, right? And to have those conversations with them. And I think um, it's hard, it's long, but the dialogue is really important. And you know, I always have to remind myself of this, is that just because you don't necessarily share an opinion with someone does not mean that they are your adversary. Um, and that in order to actually move this forward and, you know, to make the fiat something that, um, you know, lasts over the long term, it means that we have to bring people who don't necessarily share those objectives on side with it um, and recognizing how important it is uh, to make sure that those feminist principles and objectives form part of our work moving forward as Canadians. Beautiful. We have we have twenty seconds each because the a couple of people have heard stop at uh, at twelve twenty nine. So Jocelyn, I'll turn it to you for your twenty seconds. Uh, then Remy, then Kate. 
Oh, 20 seconds, so hard. I mean, the way we've tried to do this a little bit is through science diplomacy. So talking about decision makers in science in different countries, talking about examples where there's been collaborations between countries, and then using our approach to infuse that. Same thing on trade, you know, when you support local businesses who are trying to change um, and lift people out of poverty in low and middle income countries, it gets the trade people really excited because there's, you know, opportunities. So we've done it with little examples um, to try and speak to, to different um, kind of policy um, uh, movements. So that was fast. Um, just a real pleasure being here. Really appreciate the conversation and look forward to continuing it with all of you. Challenge at the end, Julia. <laughs> um, I mean, not to repeat, because I, I, all the two points resonated a lot, uh, but I think it's really about bringing people on the journey. I mean. We're doing this with our philanthropy groups. We're really doing this as well with our investment team, bringing in the private sector. And I think it's really about bringing in those local voices and the work that's happening on the ground and bringing it to the global and national stage within Canada. Um, and not being afraid to be challenged as Kate ended with her point, not being defensive when we have to learn new things and face tough truths and, and really envisioning different perspectives. Um, it may be uncomfortable at times, and I know internally it happens, not just externally, but it's really important, and, and that's truly how positive impactful change will be achieved by, by really make, bridging those gaps and simplifying language and seeing how we can achieve that same objective, which, which is ideally, and to be honest, at the end, it is the same objective, just finding ways to do so. Super quickly, I think uh, finding concrete ways to engage. Minister Gould talked about working with the defence community. I think if we think about women, peace and security and how that has really risen in prominence, I, I, I think that's a really clear example of how when we come together around a concrete issue, we can make that work. I, we at Oxfam have also done some really interesting work with, with, with the trade experts around uh, trade agreements and how to, to integrate a gender dimension into those trade agreements. Um, one thing we haven't mentioned much is, is that obviously we want to increase the ODA pie so that we're able to match our ambition with impact. And so we're going to have to get these different communities and different stakeholders on board to really push for more ODA. But I think thinking about concrete ways to engage these different communities is, is, a, is a really good way for us to, to start speaking the same language um, so that when we get to more difficult issues, we, we have some good relationships. Thank you, everyone. Uh, time to drop off. I have no concluding remarks. The, the conversation has been rich and uh, super dynamic. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the participants. Uh, there'll be more to come from CanWatch. And have a great rest of your gender equality week, everyone. Bye.